Here's how to build a modern dual cab ute that'll take you anywhere in Australia and allow you to stay there as long as you want. Now, in this video, I'm gonna show you the gear and the considerations you need to make when building up your dual cab ute so that you can go anywhere in Australia. Plus, to really get you started, look, I've grabbed a bunch of the same gear that I run on the D-Max and I'm gonna give a heap of it away throughout the video. So stay tuned to see how you can win. That's a wheel lift. Over the years, I've proven that with the right gear, you can take one of these just about anywhere in Australia. And some of the tracks I've taken this beastie down still give me the shivers today. Of course, look, everyone's gonna tell you that one of the first mods that you should do to any four wheel drive is suspension. This is true. However, over the years, I've learned the hard way, a few lessons that'll help you get the right suspension set up from the start. Now, one of the first things you're gonna to wanna to consider is what size suspension lift you're gonna run in your four wheel drive. On the D-Max, we're running a two inch lift. It keeps it legal, yet it is practical both on and off road. Unless you're wanting to spend most of your time driving really hard tracks, then look, a two inch lift will be enough in my opinion. Any higher than that, and well, you're gonna be up for a heap more costs for your suspension components just to make your four wheel drive handle well. And of course, reduce the strain on your CVs and your diffs. Now, speaking of CVs, here's one of the best mods that you can fit to stop breaking the bloody things. As soon as you lift a four wheel drive, say two inches, it changes the angle of your CV, which puts way more strain on it, which of course leads them to break a lot easier. This is why you need a diff drop. Now, a diff drop is a really affordable bit of kit that'll bring the CV alignment back to how it was as standard, meaning they're a lot less likely to break. What is far more important, however, is understanding the final weight of your four-wheel drive. Now, there are two recommendations here. Firstly, on paper, calculate what you think the final weight of your build is going to be, and then get your suspension fitted according to that final weight figure. However, my preferred method is to do the vast majority of your build first. Get your canopy on, get your water tanks in, get your bar work on and your winch done, then take your four wheel drive to a suspension specialist and they'll fit the correct suspension to the weight of your four wheel drive. The reason why you should do this, and I speak from experience here of doing it the wrong way myself, is if you get your springs rated for a fairly unmodified four wheel drive put in, by the time you add all your mods, they'll be overloaded and will sag and not perform how you want. Then of course you'll be forking out money a second time to get the right rated springs put in which could add hundreds to your build cost, and who needs that? The right setup two inch lift is spot on for dual cab utes. Now look, you've seen where I've taken the D-Max on just two inches of lift, and yes, it gets a bit hung up here and there on some of the really tough tracks, but what I like to say is, if it can do Cape York, you've got it set up spot on. What I mean by that is, if it can carry a big load of stuff on those pesky corrugations on the development road while you're heading north, plus give you the clearance and the flex for the old tally track, you've got the right rated springs and enough clearance for 95% of Australia's four wheel drive tracks. As I mentioned, I've got a heap of gear to give away in this episode, which is including a full two inch lift from Fulcrum Suspensions to help one lucky dual cab owner set up their four wheel drive like mine. To enter, well, you need to comment below and let me know what four wheel drive you own and what you reckon is the most corrugated bit of track in Australia. And if I agree, a full formula lift kit from Fulcrum, well, she's all yours. They say a picture paints a thousand words. About to show you that. Have a look at my sills under here, perfectly straight. The bar work, however, has copped an absolute beating over the years, and that's what it should look like if you're using your four wheel drive hard like I do. I'd much rather my bar work get dinged up than the body of my four wheel drive. We get asked all the time, what bar work have we got on the D-Max? It's from AFN, and not only does it look smick, it does its job. Without a word of a lie, bar work is the very first thing I'd fit to a new rig. Of course, it really should be anyway if you wanna get your suspension set up, but for the cost of the bar, it could save your entire four wheel drive. So in my opinion, it's cheap insurance. After a front bar, look, I'd ensure you get sliders because sills bend easy and are bloody hard to fix. 
and check out how well that rear bar of mine protects the tray and under tray toolboxes. If you're wanting to drive tougher tracks, sliders and a rear bar only have to save your panel damage once for them to have paid for themselves. It's that simple. Now, one of the most underrated mods you can put on your four wheel drive is a bash plate. Think about all the delicate bits and pieces underneath your rig. I'm talking transfer, sump, gearbox. Now, I reckon I would have had the D-Max on the back of a tow truck multiple times if it wasn't for the fact that I'm running quality bash plates. I suggest you get yourself a full length set that goes all the way down the rear end of your four wheel drive and make sure they're easy to put on and take off again because oftentimes when you're servicing your four wheel drive, you will need to remove the bash plate to get to the sump. Yeah, okay, so your new dual cab has just rolled off the factory floor with a set of underbody protection as standard. So why not just stick with that? Well, the answer is, it's often just plastic or at best a thin bit of tin. It doesn't protect against anything more than an empty Macca's wrapper, let alone a solid hit from a rock. Land Cruiser Mountain Park demonstrated this once when we had a full sump puncture on one of the rigs, while I drove the same line with zero issue, apart from some solid gouges on my bash plates, which is exactly what they're meant to do. Rightio, time for giveaway number two. A set of bash plates like the ones I run, and once again, what I need you to do is tell us the four-wheel drive you own and why you need a set of bash plates in the comments below. I'll choose one lucky winner. Go for it. If you've got plans to tackle some remote area touring, Cape Kimberley Simpson Desert, you're gonna to need to make a host of considerations before heading out to such locations. First and foremost, I strongly recommend fitting a quality winch. Now, if you like doing a bit of the old, old solo like I do, it's peace of mind knowing that if you do get into trouble, you can get yourself out again. And I hope you never need to use it, but a winch, in my opinion, is cheap insurance. I've literally lost count of the number of times a winch has saved our bacon when out on the tracks. Think back to Cape York last year when we actually saved Shawno's bacon when he took that extremely questionable line on the Frenchman's and got into a world of hurt. Imagine just for a second what would have happened without a winch there, or even worse, you were there solo and just took the wrong line and got badly stuck. It only has to save you as a last resort once for it to have paid for itself. Look though, if I'm honest, I rarely use a winch in anger when I'm out solo. You see, a winch, in my opinion, is a reactive piece of gear, not proactive. A winch is of no use before you get stuck, only after. I wouldn't head into the remote areas like I do, solo, without a winch, but I actually spend a lot more time thinking about my lines and take a bit more care solo so I definitely don't get stuck. I'd rather be enjoying a cold beer around the campfire. Okay, it's time to give a winch away. This time, Comment below a time when you got stuck and wished you'd had a winch to get out. I've got a brand new run for here to the biggest kook. Secondly, think about comms. Not only is it useful, of course, for talking vehicle to vehicle, but I like to run my UHF almost all the time on scan just to see who else is about and if there's anyone in at the campsites I'm thinking of heading to. Of course, a UHF is a no-brainer mod for a four-wheel drive. But if you're going on a big trip like, say, a full lap or a few weeks away up north, I reckon get a UHF that's got two features. Get one where you can easily switch between channels so you can talk to your convoy, as well as jump onto channel 40 to speak to that road train up ahead and let him know you want to pass. Also get one with the repeat feature. How many times I've been listening to music in the D-Max, Sean O pipes up and I missed what he said. Now, I can easily turn the music down, press the repeat button, which replays what he said, and I can respond. It is so bloody useful. I've got a Uniden UHF sitting here, and it's gonna go out to the first person that can tell me a situation in which they could have used a handheld radio to get them out of trouble. Best answer, you're sitting pretty with a brand new Uniden UHF. Remote locations often have a lack of two types of liquid. One of them is not beer. I'm talking fuel and water. Have a think about a method of carrying extra fuel. It might only be a 20 litre jerry that'll get you out of trouble. And of course, you're going to need to carry more water than you ordinarily would. Now, folks, when it comes to water, I break mine into two separate parts. My onboard water tank is about 110 litres and I only use it for cooking, washing up, things like that. But then I carry a spare container of 100% 
dedicated drinking water. It doesn't get used for anything other than drinking. That way, I'll never run out of drinking water, but I might just come home stinking a bit worse than normal. Also, look, some small towns only have bore water, which is fine for everything but drinking. So I can throw that in my main tank and have good water for drinking on the side. That amount of water will give me a couple of weeks out bush. If we go remote, like in the Kimberley or onto Dirk Hartog Island, like I just did recently, for safety measures, I just simply throw in an extra container of water from the shops just in case. It's cheap, a lot cheaper than adding extra water storage that you'll rarely use. Now, when setting up your rig, there's always a couple of bits and pieces that you forget to do. And it's often the non-glamorous things. Here's a couple I've forgotten in the past. Diff breathers, again, it's one of those cheap insurance mods that you've just got to make to your four wheel drive. And number two, don't forget to put rated recovery points on your four wheel drive. There are no modern four wheel drives that come off the factory floor with rated recovery points. So it's vital that you fit aftermarket ones so that you can recover your vehicle should you need to safely. See how we've mounted the diff breathers up as high as possible in the engine bay. That's so you can go up to places like Cape York and drive those deeper water crossings and ensure your diffs don't suck in a belly full of water and ruin your oil. We also run one from the transmission up here too. If water gets in that, it can cause major damage. It can cost a couple hundred bucks for a decent kit, but you could save thousands in repairs. Okay, let's move on to canopy setups. Now, how you set up your canopy is gonna come down to personal taste. What sort of comfort level you like, what you're into while you're out in the bush, everyone's different. But there are a few key ideas that will appeal to everyone. First and foremost, if you're gonna put a trundle tray down the back of your canopy, I cannot recommend more highly that you get them to fit a lid. It makes the most perfect storage spot. Barbecue can go up on top, for me, I use that area to charge all my cameras at the end of a day's filming. I would not be without the lid on that trundle tray. It is that good. Secondly, you're gonna have a fridge with a drop down slide like this one, or even a slide that just comes straight out. Make sure you get yourself some sort of cage to go around your fridge. There is nothing more annoying than items in your canopy falling behind your fridge, meaning you can't push your fridge back in. You gotta climb up in there, get it out of the way, and then put your fridge back. It's really annoying. Thirdly, folks, have a think about where you put your lights in your canopy. A lot of people put a whole heap of lights inside the canopy, when in reality, the lights need to be outside the canopy on your doors so that they shine down on your work area at night. Here's a great tip for those doing bigger trips. Invest in a canopy that is built to handle a load on the roof. A lot of cheaper canopies have no bracing up the top at all, meaning you can barely take a bloody kayak with you. A well-built canopy will give you the ability to take a tinny, a load of firewood, a gazebo, or other heavy stuff up there safely. I get asked all the time, what size fridge do I recommend? Look, I think it comes down to the simple fact that you make do with what you've got. Good friends of mine just traveled around Australia for 12 months, they took a 50 litre fridge, no dramas. I've done some very remote long-term trips with this one, with no resupply, 44 litres, zero issue. If you've got a couple of tin lids, maybe you're gonna to need to jump that up, 70, 75 litre, but at the end of the day, don't let the size of your fridge dictate when you go bush. If you don't have room for a fridge freezer dual zone, a cracking tip that I've used on several long remote trips that enables me to have a fridge and freezer in one unit is this. Freeze and vacuum pack all your meat days before you head off. Set your fridge to about two degrees, look just off freezing, then line the bottom of your fridge with all your frozen goods. On top of this, place a layer of wet newspaper, then put the fridge goods, the vegetables, your beers, etc., on top of that. The newspaper acts as a bit of a door or a barrier between the top and the bottom, keeping the frozen stuff for ages while the top is your fridge section. Now, this giveaway, I'm sure, is gonna be popular. I got a 44 litre Mike Coleman fridge to give away. Comment below the spot you'd wanna pull up and grab a beer out of your fridge. The comment that makes me the most thirsty wins a fridge. Okay, let's tackle the big question. All terrains or mud terrains? Look, if I was gonna go around Australia tomorrow, do the big lap, I would fit all terrains. They've got a significantly better wear life, 
Their puncture resistance is fantastic and they are so much better on the blacktop. And let's face it, folks, they're still gonna get you to 95% of the places you wanna go in Australia. Okay, if you wanna do some super aggressive driving whilst you're touring, maybe you should opt for a set of muddies. But at the end of the day, don't let your tire choice dictate when you go bush. Just as important as a spare tire is one accessory that'll cost you less than 50 bucks, but I guarantee can save you at some point. And I'm talking about a tire puncture repair kit. You can do everything right with your tires, speeds right, your pressure's right, the whole lot, and yet still run out of luck. In the last few years, I haven't had one puncture touch wood. But years ago, I was crossing the Great Central Road solo, and with three days of big gravel distances ahead, I punctured a tire on day one. Luckily, I had a puncture repair kit and I knew how to use it. Similar story but worse with the camera car, GU, two years ago. We blew two tyres in one day. Luckily, we had two spares with us, but we were able to repair a puncture in one so that we had a spare for the rest of the trip. Do yourself a favour, folks. Grab yourself one because you never know when your luck will run out. The old D-Max here, she gets pushed harder than just about any dual cab ute in Australia. But one thing that has never let me down is the 12 volt setup I've got in the canopy. Let me show you how I've got it set up. The heart of my charging setup is the D250SE from SeaTech. It's a 20 amp charger that keeps my single rear battery in perfect condition. I've kept it simple in my canopy with a fridge, some camp lights, and some USB and SIG charging points. But this setup works perfectly for me. I'm also running a SeaTech battery monitor here next to my fridge which lets me keep an eye on the battery from the camping side of the vehicle. Because the D250 SE also comes with a built-in battery temp sensor, the charger can compensate for any condition and give your battery the best charge possible all the time. Now, what I really love about this setup right here is the value for money I've got out of it. You can have it set up super simple like I have here, or you can add a massive battery bank up to 300 amp hour. It doesn't get much more remote than spending a week on Dirk Hartog Island. Just getting there is a mission in itself. Do it solo though, and you gotta have faith in your 12 volt setup. Add to that the need to keep cameras charged every single day, and every system has its work cut out. That said, get it right, and the feeling of being totally self-sufficient while fully remote is just awesome. Okie dokie, front or rear locker? Top question. The brand new D-Max comes with a factory rear locker. Problem solved. The older D-Max, the red one, we chose to put at one point there a front and a rear locker in, but what we found was that that front locker in the really tough stuff was just putting a lot of strain on those front CVs and we were breaking a couple. Took that front locker out and running with the rear. You're talking about a bigger rig such as the GU in the back, comes with a pretty good LSD in it, so you could get away with putting a front locker in, best of both worlds. If I only had the money for one locker in any vehicle, I would go for a rear locker. I just prefer to push the wheelbarrow rather than pull it. Have a think about that. Rear locker for me. Rightio. Got any pro tips for space saving when it comes to shelves or drawers in the canopy? Okay, look, one thing I reckon you can never have too much of is space to put things on, table space. The Mitz Alloy canopy, it really does solve that problem in a couple of ways. Firstly, the trundle tray that comes out the back. Got a great big flat area on top, big table on top. I use that all the time, way more than I ever thought I would. If you've got a trundle tray, put a table on top. So good. Secondly, that slide out table that comes out from underneath the drawer, again, didn't think I'd use that that much. I rely on it every single day. Then of course, there's that little red table that slots onto the front of the Clearview drop down fridge slide. Man, again, thought to myself, wouldn't use that much, use it all the time. Combine all three of those, table space as far as I'm concerned is the number one. Okay, here's a cracking question. How do I balance weight when it comes to doing long distances in a four wheel drive? Okay. Everything heavy, water, your spare batteries, all of that stuff I try and put forward of the rear axle. Inside the canopy, outside the canopy, it doesn't matter, but try and get it forward of that rear axle. Think of putting it in the middle, that everything light, my swag, clothing, all that kind of stuff goes anywhere I like, but generally I put that towards the rear of the vehicle. So balancing weight, all your heavy stuff in the middle, and then on the back end, put all your light stuff. Okay, you're building up a dual cab for touring purposes. Is it worthwhile putting a spring conversion in? The simple answer from me is no, it is not worth it. You see, you're gonna spend thousands of dollars and really, you're not gonna get that much benefit off-road. You see, with Leafs, you are able to carry such a larger load, 
so much more comfortably. Now, yes, you might get just a fraction more flex out of springs, but with Leafs, it just does a job so much better when it comes to carrying a load for touring. And of course, when your vehicle is empty, it does the same job. You can still carry nothing as opposed to carrying everything. Whereas with springs, it's sort of set for one weight. And yeah, you might get a little bit more flex, but not that much. And you have just said to me, you're gonna be doing touring, not tough tracks, so no. Spend those several thousand dollars on diesel, get the heck out there and enjoy that dual cab. What is more beneficial, a full length canopy like I've got on the D-Max or the GU behind me, or a half and half, say like shano has got on the Dirty 30? All right, well look, they are different for different purposes. You see, Shawnos is far, far better when it comes to the tough tracks. It's a lot lighter. His ramp over is a lot better. It's a little bit tougher because he's got that, he's only got that back end that doesn't really get sort of dented like a canopy does. Uh, and he has got a small amount of tray space there that he can use for maybe chucking a bit of firewood in. However, when it comes to bigger trips like going up to Cape York, etc., crossing the Simo, big canopies win. I can take so much more with me. All of it is out of the dust and out of the weather. Uh, it's just more protected, you can lock it up. Uh, so look, for me personally, it is a full length canopy because I like to do a lot more touring. But if you're into the really tough tracks and you want to sort of get the best of both worlds, but not really the best of either one, I would go half and half. Up to yourself, tough tracks, half and half, touring, full length canopy. Dual cab ute, keep the tub or get a tray? Okay, look, I operated out of the back of a tub uh, with a fiberglass canopy over it, as you all saw for a couple of years. When I did that damage to it up in the glass house, I was secretly pretty pretty happy with it because it meant that I could now move to a canopy. Having had a canopy on the GU for several years, I just know as a touring vehicle, working out of a canopy is so much easier, so much better than working out of a tub. So whilst the tub has its place and it's what you get with a dual cab ute, it does work. Moving across to a tray and a canopy for me for touring purposes, heaps better, way better. So if you can move across to a canopy, you'll never look back. Here's a cracker. Upper control arms or a diff drop when putting suspension kit in a dual cab ute? Look, the simple answer here is do both. The diff drop, of course, drops the diff down and brings those CVs back into line so you're not doing so much CV damage on really tough tracks. Whereas upper control arms, they correct your camber, give you better steering, they uh, give you better tire wear. So if you're lifting that dual cab two inches and above, uh, doing both is so beneficial. Diff drop and upper control arms. It brings everything back into line, almost back to factory, and it just means you can have that little bit more suspension lift without doing damage to your tyres, keep steering easier. You're not gonna do CVs as often, so really, the honest answer there, do both. Well, there you go, folks. I hope that's given you some food for thought when it comes to setting up your modern ute. And whilst those guidelines are fantastic to follow, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is getting out there and enjoying it. Hope to catch you out there, folks. Cheers for now.